church will always hope to walk in. Right, right, let's go. Brian's over there like, hey, we are live on our Facebook page. <laughs> but you tell me that ahead of time. Thank you. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Everybody at home's going, do you want a cookie? He's right. Well, no, do whatever you want. <laughs> you can even get up there and dance if you want. Isolate that voice and find out who's <laughs> Pass these out at the end of the news conference. We arrested a president and a vice president of a local baseball league, which deals with about $15,000. Did you go up It's a clearing house of stories. Which baseball league was that? Thank you. Lakeland Highlands, Babe Ruth Baseball. Is that going out in the media place? Larry, you have any sense of I'll send this out. They're.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with me today. We've really got several topics that we need to deal with. So as we go through, we will change topics along the way. But let's get to our primary reason for being here first. As you well know, the men and women of the Sheriff's Office, number one priority is to protect your children, protect our children, protect all of the children. That's, that is our prime goal and our prime focus. If we as a society can't protect our children, that's a sad state of affairs. But that doesn't happen in Polk County because of the hard work of the Sheriff's Office. Let me go over two operations that we've completed. And neither of them are a surprise to you because Operation Guardians of the Innocent, this is number four, and we call it our Fall Hall. And at the same time we did Operation Trick of Treat during the month of October to make sure our sex offenders were appropriately registering and living where they were supposed to live. So when you look at our Operation Fall Hall and our Operation Trick or Treat, this is the most we've arrested that we can remember at one time. Some people just never learn, and that's why we're here today. This operation occurred successfully because, as I said before, the hard work of the men and women of the Sheriff's Office, but we've executed up to this point 23 search warrants in order to do this investigation and we may have to obtain more search warrants. Brad Copley is the assistant state attorney that, invest, that we work with and approved all of the 23 search warrants and will prosecute the vast majority of these people and he's simply the best and we appreciate our state attorney Brian Haas assigning Brad to these difficult cases. We made a total of 31 arrests. 17 of them was as a result of Fall Hall and 14 as a result of Trick or Treat. Our forensic investigations into their electronics is still in progress at this time we anticipate that there will be many more felony charges filed later on. But let me give you a snapshot of just this group of people. These folks, just this group, had 499 previous charges. 499 previous criminal charges. And so why do I highlight that? There are people marching around the state and the country saying we're too tough on criminals. We lock up too many people. Well, if that were true, if we didn't give breaks, if we didn't have probations, if we didn't have diversions, and you looked at all of their criminal history, and all of their criminal history is not sex related, but if you looked at all of that, 499 cases, certainly they'd all be in prison forever. So, for those of you who continue to say to our constituency, oh, we got this too tough criminal justice system, we need to let people out, quit lying to the community. This is a very forgiving criminal justice system. On these folks here, we have filed 672 new felony charges with the assistance of our state attorney's office. And it's our intention for these people to never have access to our children. It's important that you understand that we are serious about these folks. And do you notice, there's not one female in the group. These deviants, these perverts are limited to male. 
and they're targeting our children online or they're watching child pornography online and we know the overwhelming majority of people that engage in watching child pornography the overwhelming majority of them would subsequently have sex with children given the opportunity but let's go through the photographs really quick and then we'll move forward with what I think is an interesting ending to all of this. Here's William Haig. He's our oldest person. He spent over 30 years working for the Polk County School District, 30 years. He was a teacher, an administrator, an assistant school, middle, an assistant principal at a middle school, We've charged him with 252 counts of child porn. He confessed. Now I want you to know he's been retired for about 18 years, so it's not like he's had any recent conduct contact with our st students in school. He's currently in jail. He's married and he has adult children. His child porn was normally children as young as eight years of age. When we served the search warrant, he was engaged in an active chat about how to have sex with children. He grew up in the school system, but he has been gone 18 years, which is a good thing. Then there's Britt Kenny. Britt Kenny's 40. He is a manager for Disney in the entertainment department. Britt has worked for 15 years for Disney. We've arrested him two times. We arrested him once and he bonded out and we found additional materials and we put him back in prison or in the county jail. He's married. He doesn't have any children. We charged him with 24 counts of child porn. He said he's been viewing child porn for 22 years. And he fantasizes. He fantasizes that he's the child being victimized in the child porn that he watches. He prefers children as young as two or three years old. This guy is scary. This guy is a deviant. This guy is a person who has deep-rooted sexual issues. He's in jail and he confessed. Well, he's not by himself. There's another Disney employee by the name of Donald Durr. He's 52 years of age. He has worked with Disney for 20 plus years. He's currently assigned maintenance in the hotels. And he said, are you ready for this? You know, you can't make this stuff up. Here's what Donald told us during this interview. I'm a pervert, but I'm not a monster. Are you kidding me? I agree with the first part of your statement. You are a pervert, but here's a news flash. You're also a monster a monster with a capital M. We charged him with eight counts of possession of child porn. He's still in the jail. How about Edgar Villegas? He's 28. Edgar's already been to prison for possession of child porn. He spent six years. He prefers children as young as two years of age. He was released from prison. Are you ready for this? He was released from prison in March of this year on probation. And guess what? We found him in possession of more child porn while he's on probation. We've got him charged so far with two counts. We're still going through 
the forensics on his computing computer and obviously violation of probation. Now here's what's interesting. He does six years in prison. He's released in March. We can see where he's been accessing child porn back to at least May. So he's released from prison. He's still on probation. He did six years and he immediately goes back to viewing child porn. You know what his statement was? Well, I relapsed. I made a poor choice. Duh. You made more than one poor choice. He's in jail. And then there's Charles Mabry. <clears throat> Charles is 37. Are you ready for this? He's in prison while he's doing this. That's right. He's in prison. He's in prison for two years for that low-level, nonviolent crime they talk about of methamphetamine. And he's in work release. You see, they're preparing him to go back into society and be successful because it's what they call that low-level, nonviolent drug meth. Not only is he on work release, he's got a GPS monitor. Well, guess what? While he's in prison, on Sundays, with his GPS monitor, he's allowed to go to his daddy's house. Um, being a trained detective, guess when he was looking at the child porn? On Sundays at his daddy's house. Still in prison looking at child porn. He does quality control work for Florida Beef in Wachula. We've got him now charged with 53 counts of child porn. 53 counts. So you see what I'm saying? You try to help these rascals out. And this guy, while he's still in prison, is looking at child porn. He must have an IQ of about 17, is all I can figure. Rodney Montgomery is 51. He previously was arrested when he traveled in Pinellas County to meet a 13 or 14 year old who turned out to be an undercover detective. Over there, they only sentenced him to 21 months in the Florida State Prison System. It's more than obvious that Brad Copley was not the prosecutor. Well, he confessed this time. We've got him for 20 counts of promotion, 10 counts of possession, children as young as five years of age. He's already done 21 months when he traveled to meet a minor. So we know he not only looks at child porn, he will travel if he thinks he can have sex with a minor. They don't change, folks. People with this set of deviant ethics and morals don't change. How about Brian Murray? He's 54. He traveled to meet a 13-year-old. He was going to pay the child for sex. He sent nude pictures of himself, of himself. He sent nude pictures of himself to what he thought was a 13-year-old child. Fortunately, it was our undercover detective. Listen to this. Here's his quote. He's talking to a 13-year-old child. I can take better care of you than the little schoolboys. He's 51 years old. He's saying that to a 13-year-old girl who he sends nude pictures of himself to this child. That's right. I'm sorry, he, he had the real victim, but we took over the account. That wasn't an undercover operation. This was to a real child, and then we took over the account and finished up the operation with our undercover. I want you to think about that for a second. Brian Murray, who's 54, 
was online with a 13 year old sending nude pictures of himself and talking about how he was far superior than the little schoolboys. We charged him with attempted lewd battery, transmission, computer, uh, using a computer to seduce a child, traveling, and he confessed. I'm glad that they called us. Then there's Michael Arambulo. Now, if you get really sick or you're really injured and you end up at the heart of Florida, at some point in time, he could have been your ICU nurse because that's where he worked. But he likes child porn, children as young as five. We charged him with 10 counts of child porn, which is an F2. He confessed to looking at child porn. And when we served the search warrant, he was looking at pornography at the time we went to serve the warrant. It's my understanding he is not currently working at Heart of Florida Hospital. I think that's a good thing. I would hate to wake up in ICU and see that dude there. And here's Mark Ott. He's a mechanical engineer. He's 49 years of age. He has two sons, one of them still in high school. He's charged with 74 counts of possession of child porn. Children as young as three months. Did you hear me? Children as young as three months. Ladies and gentlemen, it makes me sick to my stomach when I see this. But now I want to introduce you to two more people. You're going to have to follow me with this because it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a conflicted interwoven tale. I want to introduce you to Jacob Jackson. Jacob is 31. He was soliciting a 13 year old on Facebook. The 13 year old on Facebook notified the sheriff's office and we sent patrol out there. The 13 year old said, hey, I know who this guy is. His name is Jared Jackson, but he's going online as Jacob Jackson. And we said, well, how do you know that? The 13 year old girl said, I did my own research on the FDLA website and I saw his picture, and I know his name's Jared Jackson. Wrong. There's Jared Jackson, his brother, a year and a day younger than Jacob. That's right. Jared was already on the FDLE website. So here's what happened. Jacob is online trying to hit on this 13-year-old child. She's astute enough to research and she sees Jared picture, Jared's picture and as you can tell, they can't deny being brothers. They look almost the same. So as a result of this investigation, we're also investigating and we find that Jared Jackson, who's not supposed to be living at his mother's address is living at his mother's address with Jacob. Jared, while on, while there illegally at his mother's address, is trying to deal with Jacob Jackson when Jared catches him talking to this 13 year old online. So Jared and his mother take Jacob's computer away from him to stop him from talking to the 13 year old. And Jared says he's counseling with his brother about how bad prison is and he does not want to end up in the same shape as his brother. So maybe here's a conversation they're having. Jacob, I tried to warn you and you're just an idiot. 
And Jacob says, Jared, do you think they'll let us stay together in the same jail cell? Jared says, I doubt it. But heck, we can ask. It doesn't hurt. After all, we're going to be spending time together. Jacob, you're my brother. I don't know what they're saying. They're just idiots. Mama's got to be proud. Are there any questions before we go on to the next? Oh, we have one more. Nope, nope, let's stop it right there because I want a line of demarcation between these next two issues. Isn't there a possibility that this kind of a perversion is genetically handed down, which is why both these guys screwed up? Do you know that is something you need to ask a psychiatrist or psychologist? I, I suggest to you that it's probably learned behavior. You can, you can learn from your brother to do stupid stuff. And the other thing is they go to prison. It's not like learning a lesson. It's something internal that drives them. Is, can they be rehab, number one? And number two, are, are there any programs? Or can we beat the hell out of them or whatever it takes? to extinguish that behavior because then they're going back to the same thing yep. they're more kids. History tells us that these folks don't change the proclivity for irrational, perverted sexual conduct or feelings. There is research that says that some, not all, can be taught to control those emotions. But understand, the reason we put them in prison and jail is to get them away from children. But they're out, and that's the problem. They, you, you don't keep everyone in forever. That's why we have a very robust system in the state of Florida and here at the Sheriff's Office where we, will, we follow these folks and track them. And see, we arrest these folks periodically all along. On Halloween Day, we were out following up on all of our registered sex offenders, all of them, to make sure they didn't have lights on and candy out and decorations to entice children to come to their different residences. So there's a lot that goes on that you don't see. But this is just a cancer on society that we have to deal with. And this is a cancer that I suggest never will be cured. We can only keep it under control with prisons and we can only keep it under control with a lot of medication while they're on this controlled release or probation or offender watch status. Eric, would you say that it's gotten worse with the internet and making it so easy to disseminate informa information? I, I can tell you the internet has made it much easier for sexual predators to prey on children because now they can go into virtual game sites, social media sites, and pretend to be people that they're not. I can tell you that way back in the day, BC, before computers, that's someplace between the Stone Age and where we are now, okay? That when we saw child porn, it was old eight millimeter, cheaply produced stuff from another country. The child porn we're seeing today is produced with phones such as this that have marvelous, marvelous ability to not only take still photos, but videos. So it's easier to make child porn it's easier to transmit child porn, and it's easier for them to communicate and to locate each other. Birds of a feather flock together, and they find each other. And then we go in and we clip their wings. Can you speak to the toll it takes on the techniques of this season? Well, it's the folks that work in this investigative area are go through psychologicals every six months to, and we also have our other EAP, 
but we actually have counseling sessions with them because this is this is the most horrible nasty stuff you just can't believe what they're subjected to to conduct these investigations you cannot believe what they see and and I keep being shocked when people suggest to me that quote unquote and I hate to hear this term kitty porn is a 16, 17, 15 year old girl who looks 25 and acts that way. Wrong. These are pictures of babies. Some as young as infants in diapers that are being sexually abused by developed grown men. It is horrible and quite frankly it's illegal to share, we would never share, but I only wish that the public had a full understanding of how deviant these people are with what they're watching as far as video clips and are still pictures. Some of this is a live movie of these children being sexually abused with the screaming and crying and hollering. But if the people in the, what I call the real world saw what we saw, they'd probably take up arms against them. Were you able to locate, I know some of the victims had contacted you, but the other ones where you found the people in possession of child porn, were you able to locate any of the victims? Did you make it local? We have not been able to locate the victims of the child porn yet. That's always a primary objective, but we work with Nick Mick as we have this time. And Nick Mick has algorithms of this and, and has been successful in identifying the victims of crime. That's obviously our number one priority. Where are the children that are victimized in this child porn? That's always a number one desire to locate the victim so we can rescue them. And with this investigation, besides the one where you caught them going to the park and the other teen, um, was it mostly just undercover? detectives communicating with them online and that's how you were able to find them or? Most of these were, they were exchanging child porn among themselves and through investigative techniques we were able to identify them. They were either sending or receiving. Okay. All right, let me talk about this fella here. You can't make this stuff up. You just really can't. But, but you need to know who this guy is. This is old Awani Basta. That's short for Awani Abdel Malik Basta. That's his fir full name. I don't think his parents liked him when they gave him that name, but that's not my business. He's 52 years old, he's from Bartow. He originated in Egypt, he's now a US citizen. He's been listed since a sex offender since 2009. He has 17 previous felony charges and we have given him three new charges. He is a serial stalker. His charges, and that's why I separated, let me underscore, is not related to children. His, children, his charges are related to adults. Okay, so in 2009, he was designated a sexual offender. Since 2013, he's been known to visit Starbucks, Panera Bread stores, where he grabs the bottom of women. That's right, he gropes them. There's at least seven documented cases. Now that doesn't count the women that probably slapped him, pushed him back, asked him what happened and walked off and said, I ain't got time for you. This guy's a, got problems. I mean, he's got problems. He was arrested and convicted for a case in October 15 at Lakeland Panera Bread. He's currently in the county jail on a Starbucks case from Lakeland 
And we've also charged him with three counts of failure to comply, to comply with sexual offender registry laws. But let me tell you something. If you get in front of this rascal at a store, he liable to grab your butt. He's got a hitch in his giddy up. I mean, I just don't know what's wrong with him. But we're going to keep him in jail for a while, and if he grabs butts down there, somebody will poke him in the nose. <laughs> I, well, this guy's got something. But ladies, beware. Does he buy anything? I mean, Latte, I think. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know what he likes at Panera Bread and Starbucks other than girls' butts. I just don't know. But this guy's a this guy's dangerous. I mean, what's next? But he literally, I mean, he's just he's got issues. Watch out for him. He's he's seriously dangerous. Okay. Now let me have a clear line of demarcation from the next one. I'm gonna give you the thirty thousand foot view. My very competent communication staff will give you the details. This is a case that needs to be all over the news. This is John Sprague. He's the president of the Highland City Little League Softball League. And Larry Blevins, who's the vice president. You're not going to believe this. This is one of the largest thefts that we can remember of stealing from a youth organization. Together, they stole $56,000 from Highland City Youth Leagues. They stole the children's money. Did you hear me? I mean, picture this. Hardworking parents taking their children to the ballpark, doing the right thing, socially interacting, teaching the children the value of competition and team play. and the, You can't say enough great things about a youth ballpark and all the parents there doing the right thing. That's all American. That's the way things are supposed to be. And these two guys are stealing. They're stealing from these children that are having cake sales, candy sales, chocolate sales. They're stealing from the children. After they got in charge of the league as president and vice president, guess what? They each got them a debit card and they systematically drained the account over time. This began in September of 2018. My anger is unending for these folks because they stole from the children. Because while all the parents are there doing all the right things and are to be applauded and trusted these people as president and vice president of the association so that this money could be appropriately spent in furtherance of the children, our children were ripped off. There's not enough bad things to say about these people. You know, you can't say what are you thinking because obviously they don't have anything to think with. So there you go. Is there any questions about these guys? What did they spend it on? Just they paid, they paid their personal cell phone bills, electric bills. They just used the debit card. They just, it was just another source of income. When did the uh, association, like the parents, notify you all? I don't know how long we've been investigating it, but these things take time because once you're notified, then you have to subpoena the records from the bank. You have to wait for the bank to get the records back to you. Then you have to compare the bank records and expenditures to the legitimate expenditures of the association because some of them can look similar. And then you have to get witnesses to say, you know, no, we don't have AT&T cell phones here. So any AT&T expenditure for a cell phone is not 
a legitimate. So these th are protracted investigations. Well, that's how we always find out. Someone on the board started questioning, where's the money going? And that's how we find out. But was there no oversight on a per purchase? $60,000, that's a lot of money. That's well, they drained, they drained it over some time. I mean, they just didn't dump it out in yeah, one month. They figured that out after the first five or 10 or 15 or 20. Because what happens many times with these volunteer associations is they come in, the treasurer comes in and says, hey, we had $100,000, we spent 9000 last month, and everybody goes, yeah, we had to buy uniforms, we had to buy balls, we had to buy bats, and so now we got 91000 in the bank, and they go, yay, congratulations, all in favor, aye, aye, and it's paid and it's gone. They don't look at line-by-line -line purchases, and some don't even require line-by-line line data. The, historically, we find these volunteer organizations more often than we would like to see keep sloppy books and it creates an environment for this. I can't tell you that's the case in this one because I've not dug down into it, but I can tell you that's the pattern. And certainly Scott may be able to clear that up, I'm, I'm confident. But I want you to get a clear look at people that will steal from your children. I mean, I, I don't understand why they just didn't, you know, go out in the parking lot and steal out of people's unlocked cars. Heck, maybe they did. I, I, you know, why, why would you steal from the children? These children go out, go out and sell and raise money so they can have things and you know that's all part of teaching children to grow up to be responsible to say hey if we want these shirts or if we want these balls and bats or if we want this new field we got to raise money and we all got to work because when you work and you do good and you raise money then you get things. Sheriff, what did they say when you all arrested them and did they confess? They asked for attorneys. I assume that one guy knew that the other guy was doing it. So might have even talked about it like, hey, you know, because. Well, they both had a debit card. They both knew they were doing it. Did they have any previous charges? I don't know. The, we were so busy putting this together, I said, let me make them aware of it. Scott and uh, his team will fill you in on, on their background. But, you know, th this is the one that, you know, obviously this needs coverage, but, you know, tell your teams, you know, on Sunday why the Bucks are losing, run this instead, you know, I mean, I mean, people need to know. People need to know. Okay, anything else? I appreciate you. Take care. Have a good day. Have a great weekend and be safe.